Well, welcome to Crossroads to everybody and a special hello to all you fathers. Happy Father's Day. I'm grateful to be part of a church that recognizes and really celebrates the role that dads as well as all men play in the formation of their children or those around them. Um, I had a great time on Friday evening with my son. We were here at the father-son barbecue and just got to laugh and make some memories with some other fathers and their children. And it's just a, a fun night. And I'm grateful to just be celebrated uh, here as a congregation. And we have some fun ways to do that out in the atrium. If you already haven't had a cronut, you need to get one, whether you're a dad or not. I mean, just everybody needs a cronut, I think, to kick off a Sunday morning. Um, I, today, as many of you know, uh, I lost my dad earlier this year, so Father's Day this year is a little tender. Uh, I'm just uh, grateful for the, I mean, literally eternally grateful for the impact my father had in my life. Just a powerful example of what it looks like to live and love like Jesus that I saw in my father. Uh, I'm grateful for his faithfulness to my mom and to our family, and certainly to God, and just the involvement that he had in the local church. And whether you're a dad or just you're a man here today, I want to say thank you for making God a priority in your life today. I hope that you don't underestimate the influence that you can have and the impact you can have on your family, but also on those around you just by living out your faith. And worshiping with us every week is just a one way of that being with God. And it's a great example for your family and for all those around you. So uh, thanks for being here. Have a cronut for being here, right? So just uh, happy Father's Day. We're in the middle of a teaching series. We're entitled Q&A. And if you haven't been here with us yet, just wanted you to know that we're uh, looking at uh, several topics that were submitted by questions from our congregation. And in the very first week, we tried to address this question. What does the Bible say about God's power and goodness in the light of all the evil and suffering in the world? And we walk through several truths that are found in the Bible about God's sovereignty, but also about the free will that he's given to all of us and we recognize that many of the challenges, the evil, the suffering that's in our world today are caused by the choices that you and I make or the choices that others make around us. And what we realize is that in the midst of suffering and evil, God is our refuge and our strength. He is our ever-present help in any time of trouble. Second week, last week, we looked at this question. What does the Bible say about sin, where it comes from, and the consequences of it? The Bible teaches us that at the root, sin is finding the identity, satisfaction, and joy in anything other than God. And oftentimes, our pursuit of that is through disobedience to God's commands and his principles. It's doubting his character and maybe even his power. It's just choosing to be in control of our own life instead of letting God be in charge. Now, I mentioned that our approach to uh, the topics, the ones that we have covered, as well as the ones that are starting today in the next couple of weeks, which, as I mentioned last week, are of a little more mature nature. They're a little more intense. Our approach to all those, regardless of the topic, is recognizing that we believe the, the Bible has a lot to say about how to navigate life in the complex issues around us. The Bible truly is the source of all wisdom, and by learning God's word and applying it to our life, we can navigate the situations in our life and the complexity of the world around us. We also acknowledge that many of life's questions don't have simple yes and no answers, that they're more complex than that. But we believe that God's word speaks all truth. And God's word is an anchor for us when those simple answers may not just satisfy. We believe that God's word, what he says, is filled with good news. And that because he is the creator, he knows how life is supposed to function and how it's best to live. With that in mind, today's question is this. What does the Bible say about the origin and value of life and to the choices that we make concerning the unborn? Isn't that a fun Father's Day topic for us all, right? We receive numerous questions that range from questions like this. Where does life begin? Who determines the value of life? Should people have the choice to make decisions about their life, about their body? Again, we want to recognize that we're attempting to discover what the Bible says about these topics and to gain wisdom to navigate these complex issues in our lives and our world today. And I think we'd all agree that the issues around the origin of life and its value are complex 
and certainly very personal. The questions today might not come just from a sense of curiosity, but more than likely from a deep sense of pain or a deep sense of struggle with these type of questions. We're going to begin in the same place that we've actually began the last two weeks, at the beginning of all time in creation, when God created the world. It's very obvious from the Bible that God is the source of life. He's the giver of life. You can say he's the author of life, which means he has the authority over life. Genesis 2 verse 7 reads, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. This is the beginning of human life. And God is the source of it. Every living creature, especially humankind, gets life from God. And being created in the image of God, we as humans, we're given the ability as well as the responsibility to multiply, to reproduce, to procreate, which means to pass life on. Genesis 1.27 says this, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. While the man and woman were given the opportunity to participate in the activity, God is still a source of life. So one of the biggest questions asked is a question that's been heatedly debated is when does life begin? Well, there are several places that we can turn to in the Bible to look for help in answering this question. Psalm 139 is one of those places, and David praises God for knowing everything about him. His thoughts, when he sits and when he rises, when he lies down and when he gets up. David says, God, you know every word I'm about to say before I say it. John, while it's still on before it uh, exits my lips. With that kind of confidence in God knowing everything and God being ever-present, David then makes this declaration. It's recorded in verse 13 through 16 of Psalm 139. David says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. Notice what David says there. He says first that God knew him from the very beginning because he created him. He gave him life in his mother's womb. David says you put me together. You knitted me together. There's this phrase of like embroidered me. If you know anything about embroidery, you know it's intricate needlework that the result is a beautiful piece of art. That's how David describes what God has done for him in his mother's womb. David says, my frame was not hidden from you. And that frame represents the skeletal structure of his body, but also his psyche. Both were known by God from the very beginning. David also says, your eyes saw my unformed body. That unformed body word is the same word by which we get the word embryo. This incomplete or incomplete formless mass of tissue is God's work. It's life from the very beginning. God did not passively observe the development of that embryo, but was actively engaged in helping take that life take shape and form to give it purpose and potential and value. David might be unaware of the genome which contains all hereditary information in a fetus, but he was not unaware of the concept of a seed, a seed that had in itself hereditary characteristics that allowed for multiplication and reproduction as well as that procreation, the passing on of life. With the mind of a scientist and the skill of a poet, David praised God for fearfully and wonderfully making him. God has constant knowledge and presence, David says, care and and concern for him while he was being formed in his mother's womb. God saw another person from the moment that the egg and the sperm met. And David 
He recognized God's involvement and care in the forming and the development of his body and his personality prior to life. And David wasn't alone in that. There are several biblical authors that speak to that. One of them is Isaiah, who wrote these words, referring to God, he who made you, who formed you into the womb or in the womb, who formed you in the womb, I, the Lord, am the maker of all things. Jeremiah quotes God by saying this, before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nation. Even the apostle Paul writes in Galatians 1, 15, when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, you can see that the, the origin of life starts from the very beginning, from conception. Science has provided for us an array of amazing facts about the rapid development of a just conceived child inside the womb. On day one, the very first day when conception happens, all 46 chromosomes, the building blocks of life, are present. As many of you know, uh, my wife and I have three children, two daughters on the end and a son in the middle. Our son, after birth, we realized and were informed that Kate had Down syndrome. And the first question on our mind was really, how did this happen? What did we do to cause this? And through further investigation and some hereditary testing, genetical, genetic testing, we found that the moment of conception is when Cade received his extra chromosome. From day one, that's where life seems to begin. Go to day 22, just three weeks into this development process, the heart begins to beat. If I was to ask you an objective question, like, when does life end? All of us would probably know the right answer to that, when the heart stops. So it's very obvious that the start of life then would be sort of the same, right? That life would start when the heart begins beating. That's at day 22, really early in the game. Another sign of life. This heart starts pumping blood through the body. A blood type can be determined even at 22 days in. At day 35, which is about five weeks in, the child has eyes and legs and hands begin to develop. At week six, day 43, brain waves are detectable. Mouth and lips are formed and fingers start. In day 49, which is seven weeks in, the baby starts moving and kicking. By this point, the baby has a nose, eyelids, and toes are forming. We see a picture of this detectable activity in the womb later in the New Testament. When Jesus was in his mother's womb, and she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant, Luke records these words. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, signs of life. In week eight, day 56, every organ is in place. Bones and fingerprints are forming. In day 63, nine weeks, the teeth are formed. Fingernails develop. This baby at this point now can turn, but also can frown. And in day 77, at 11 weeks into the, the life, babies can grasp objects in their hands. All these are some of the earliest signs of life from day one. Let me ask you another objective question. When do you tell people that you're employed at your current place of employment? Is it when you've mastered all the roles and responsibilities that have been entrusted to you? Or is it in day one when you show up for your first shift? Talk about married life. When do you tell your friends that you're married? Once you've perfected the role of husband or wife, or on your wedding day, the moment you say, I do. All of those are relative to where we see life beginning from day one. We also get a sense from the Bible how God values life in the womb. In the Old Testament, there were laws that protected all kinds of aspects of life. But there was also a provision that protected an unborn baby, and there was punishment for Anybody who injured that baby or its mother. Exodus 21, 22 through 25 reads, if people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there's serious injury, either to the mother or to the baby, 
You're to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Basically, it says if the baby is born okay, then just a fine. But if the baby dies in utero, the person responsible must die. We see from this that God values life from the start and protects the unborn from harm. Every human life has value because God is the source of life. And every human is created in the image of God. Nothing else in all of creation has that status. Yet we have people who fight tirelessly to save the trees, the ozone, the sea turtles, whales, and a whole host of other living things. Having that biblical understanding, we are left to navigate several issues in our world today. And one of those issues is the issue of abortion, the termination of a pregnancy, or the ending of a life of an unborn child through medications or through medical procedures. Abortion is really not a new practice. Voices like Virgil and Juvenal in antiquity acknowledge that an unborn child was a human. Middle Assyrian law, dating back to about the 11th century BC, considered abortion a a serious offense, punishable by death, and there were two major factors. The first factor was this, that abortion was an offense between the relationship that a mother has with her child. And the second, abortion was an offense to the state because it killed future citizens. Abortions have been practiced for a millennia. Egyptians in 1500 BC were often using chemicals to induce or to to end a pregnancy. And in about the first century AD, we see procedures that would remove a fetus from the womb. Fast forward to the 1700s, as our country was beginning. And there was a strong practice of abortion, but there was a strong avoidance to practice abortion After quickening, if you're not familiar with that term, it just means when the baby starts to move. It was, there was medical research as it advanced, there became a, a knowledge of the elaborate developmental process of a child in the womb that began at conception and continued all the way through birth. And as those medical advances were well known, actually it was physicians in the 1800s who considered, said that, if abortion was looked down upon after a baby started moving, that it was definitely the case that abortion should be looked down upon even before the baby would be moving. And so around 1900, abortions had completely been abolished in our country. Then in 1973, the Supreme Court ruled that a couple things. One, no state could make any laws regulating abortion during the first three months of a pregnancy other than they mandated that abortions must be performed by a physician. The second thing they ruled was that laws re- regulating abortion between the third month and the time of viability, which they estimated around six months, were constitutional, only in as far as that they were aimed at safeguarding the health of a mother. The third thing was, no law could prevent abortion after six months until the end of pregnancy if safeguarding the mother's health was the issue. And then finally, they defined the health of a mother to include all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and a woman's age. Ever since that decision, There have been battles and battles, rounds and rounds of legislative battles over the legality of abortion between those who are maybe labeled pro-life and those who would be pro-choice. I want to just make a note here that to be pro-choice doesn't necessarily mean that you're pro-abortion. It just might mean that you think that a person deserves the right to choose. But those are basically the two camps we see making uh, lots of discussion about this topic. Since 1973, 63 million abortions have been performed in our country alone. If you take that number, and you can consider it's about over a million every year since 1973, that's more people per year 
That died in all of the following battles. The Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I and World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, the Persian Gulf War, the Iraqi War, and the Afghan War. All of those casualties of Americans put together, there are more abortions that happen every year than that number. Some other statistics that caught my attention this past week in preparation for this message, that of those who had an abortion in 2019, 9% of those were in their teens. 57% of those were in their 20s. 31% were in their 30s and even 4% in their 40s. 60% of those who had an abortion in 2019 already had at least one child. Some had as many as four. 93% of the abortions that occurred in 2019 all happened in the first trimester before most of those things that we talked about earlier had a chance to happen. At the heart of the debate, maybe between these two camps, pro-life and pro-choice, is the issue, when does life begin? I hope by this point in our time together, you have seen that the Bible addresses that the source and origin of life is God. This brings value to every life from the moment of conception in the womb. Abortion attacks the value of life in the womb by dismissing that that life is really just a a gathering of tissues, which can be disposed of by the decision of the mother. That certainly dismisses the value of life found there. Isn't it interesting that in all other situations where a person would decide that another person's life should end is prohibited by law and also punishable by consequences. But abortion seems to be contradictory. Let me give you an example that's related. 38 states in the United States have fetal homicide laws that distinguish first, second, and third degree murder as well as manslaughter and assault crimes related to the unborn. Saying that if whomever causes the death premeditated of a child that's unborn with intent to harm, that person is subject to all the consequences of those type of crimes. The status is even defined the unborn, as somebody who's an offspring of a human being conceived, yet not born. So how do those same 38 states also have a law that allows abortion? Well, it defines that the whomever cannot be the mother of the child. Basically saying it's illegal to take the life of an unborn if the mother wants the baby, but it is legal to take the life of the unborn if she does not. God is the source of life, and he is the one who brings value to life. And so we must acknowledge him as the authority of and over life and value life the same way that he does. God is the author of life, which means he holds the authority. And since life begins at conception, it must be valued and protected from the start. God's divine person-forming work in the womb is not to be preempted by anyone. Only God confers personhood both inside and outside the womb. And for us to take that responsibility or make that decision places us in the position that only God belongs. One of the heated arguments about abortion and its legality today is the rights of the mother. And you might hear the statement often, well, it's my body and it's my rights. That kind of attitude is actually anti-God in all forms, not just with the issues of life, but in any aspect of your life, whether you're male or female. We know from scripture that God is the authority and our opportunity is to submit to his lordship. And Paul refers to our bodies in what he writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, don't you know that your your bodies are the living temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? That God is in you and he purchased you with the blood of his own son. That your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to him. So honor God with your body. That's true for men, that's true for women. It relates to the issues of life. It relates to all of life. There have been many other arguments made to support the legality of abortion, 
like the protection of the mother's health. There could be cases of rape or incest, which actually only amount to less than 2% of the total number of abortions annually. There's the challenge of an unsupporting environment, especially when the pregnancy was unplanned. There's the developmental abnormalities of the baby while still in the womb. And I can speak to that one a little bit. Uh, The past 21 years of raising a child with some disabilities has certainly not been the easiest in the world. But the way that that has impacted the life of our family, our other children, and those around them, sometimes, though it's hard, makes it so beautiful what God has done. While all of these have significant issues and complex in our complex situations, I think they all emerge from a deeper question about God's sovereignty, questions about his power and his goodness, as well as they lead to questions about his purposes and his plans. While there might not be answers to all of the questions, we must not doubt or interfere what with God is doing, what he might be fulfilling. We can debate continuously about when a baby becomes a life or why this or that has happened, why um, all these situations are, are so troubling around us. We can draw political lines between us. We can fight over the freedom that it's our body, our health, our plans, our future. But the Bible is very clear that what is happening in the womb is a unique person forming work of God. And only God knows how deeply mysterious and and wonderful that this creation of personhood is as he weaves that into life. And therefore, it's arbitrary and even unwarranted to assume that at some point in the knitting together of this person that we have the right to destroy what God is doing. And that is an assault on the prerogatives of God as our creator. The destruction of a conceived human life, whether embryonic, fetal, or viable, is an assault on the unique person forming work of God. I feel like I need to stop right here just for a moment and just acknowledge that in an audience this size, I'm quite confident that there are both mothers and fathers who have deep personal encounters with this issue, not just of life, but also abortion. And to you who have performed an abortion on the life that God blessed you with, I want you to know confidently that God loves you. Your choice may have broken his heart, but it didn't extend you past his love for you. And as we learned last week, all of us, according to Romans 1, have made choices that break God's heart. All of us have found ourselves in places where we thought we knew better where we made decisions for our own good, our own body, our own plans, and those were often contrary to what God would want for us. And when we find ourselves in that place, it's easy to feel guilty. It's easy to just feel the weight of those choices. But I want to remind you how God feels about you. He loved you so much despite the choices that any one of us have made and extends to us love and forgiveness and grace. And that love and forgiveness and grace can bring healing. It can bring peace of mind and heart. It can also bring the cleansing from a guilty conscience. And those aren't just my words. Those are God's words. Look what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who's over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that, bring, that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that it is our practice that before any sermon is preached, we, we review that sermon and we actually share that with people who speak into these messages. Two of the people who spoke into this message today, one is a father and one is a mother who both were vulnerable to say that in their past, they had abortions on the child that God had blessed them with. I'll speak to the mother 
and her perspective in just a moment. But right now, the father wanted me to say to you that of all the things he could say about the choices that he's made in the past, he has found God's forgiveness to bring healing. And he can't wait to get to heaven to meet two children that he never got to meet here on the face of this earth. Several of the questions that we received all dealt around um, the issue, the question about this. They said, why is abortion such a huge issue to most Christians and the church that they actually elevate this issue of abortion and, and the origin of life above all the other life issues that God speaks about in the Bible? In fact, one of the questions included a quote from a pastor whose name is Dave Barnhart. Look what he had to say. He says, the unborn are a convenient group of people to advocate for. They never make demands of you. They are morally uncomplicated, unlike the incarcerated, the addicted, or the chronically poor. They don't resent your condescension or complain that you are not politically correct. Unlike widows, they don't ask you to, uh, they, don't, they don't ask you to question patriarchy. Unlike orphans, they don't need money or education or child care. Unlike aliens, they didn't bring all that racial, cultural, and religious baggage that you dislike. They allow you to feel good about yourself without any work at creating or maintaining relationships. And when they're born, you can forget about them because they cease to be unborn. It goes on to say, you can love the unborn and advocate them for them without substantially changing your own wealth, power, or privilege, without reimagining social structures, apologizing, or making reparations for, to anyone. They are, in short, the perfect people to love if you want to claim to love Jesus, but actually dislike people who breathe. People like prisoners or immigrants, the sick, the poor, widows, orphans. All the groups that are specifically mentioned in the Bible, they all get thrown under the bus for the unborn. Those might be hard words for us to hear as Christians. I don't know that it's unfair in its criticism of those Christians who call themselves Christians and have been passionate about the legislation prohibiting abortion, but have yet been unconcerned about the mother of the child not providing any assistance or support if she chooses not to abort her child or making her feel as that she's committed the unforgivable sin if she does or being so fixated on this one issue and dismissive of the other life issues. Instead of valuing all life and working to care for others, especially those who are vulnerable, under-resourced, treated as outcasts, even those who look or think or vote differently than us. To believe what the Bible teaches, that life begins at conception and that all life is valuable, because every person is created in the image of God, compels you and I to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves, to ensure justice for those who are being crushed, to speak up for the poor and the helpless, and to see that they get justice. This includes the woman who's facing pressure from her family, her boyfriend, even the child's father, to end the life of her baby that's in her womb. It also includes the father who was left out of this decision altogether. This includes the mother and the father who choose to have an abortion, and it includes the child and the mother and father who are living in just challenging environments. This includes those who are struggling to have food, need shelter, lack proper health care, who are facing chronic illnesses, who are imprisoned, addicted, who are living in the country illegally, who have cognitive or physical disabilities. It really includes anyone that you and I lock eyes with. We must value every human being because every human being, from the moment they are conceived, were fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And we best reflect his image, his character, and his heart when we love every person the way that God does. Before I pray today, I wanted to point out just some resources that we are providing for all kinds of just people in, in the situation that we've talked about today, these issues of life. They're here on the screen and they're also available on our website, cccgo.com forward slash info. If you find yourself today 
Maybe wondering like, where does life begin? How do I just navigate these issues? I would encourage you to become informed and I also encourage you to become engaged. One place you might start is Unplanned by Abby Johnson. There's a book and a movie that tells her story as a past abortionist to being somebody who is defending the rights of those unborn because she believes that she has seen where God puts the beginning line and that's at conception. Also would encourage you to check out the podcast called Unplanned Grace. Maybe you find yourself here today and you're a person who made a choice in your past to have an abortion. I'd encourage you, especially if you're a woman, to check out surrenderingthesecret.com. It's a website and resources provided just for you to help you walk through the emotional and the psychological issues that come with making a choice like that. I'm also grateful that we as a church have strong relationships with organizations like the Right to Life Organization of Southwest Indiana. They have been on the front line of this issue for many years and recognize that this isn't an issue. This is actually a life. And they're committed to both the unborn baby, but also the mother. Likewise, organizations like the Trotter House right here in Evansville provides counseling prior to birth, able to show ultrasounds to mothers so they can see life right before their eyes. They also are committed to walk with that mother and the child when they come into this world by a beautiful child boutique where they pass out free diapers and clothing and strollers and everything that's needed to start a family. They also provide counseling and support to mothers and fathers, both before a baby, after a baby, and also to those who made the choice to abort that baby. And we partner with them because they're experts in this field and they're there to serve in the name of Jesus in this community. Lastly, I will point you to what we call a personal story. It's that mom who had an abortion several years ago who speaks of the decision she went through and the ramifications of that and the healing and the peace that God has brought her through his love. And she offers her cell phone number her email address to anybody that she could help walk through before or even after a choice like this. We want those resources to help all of us not just become informed, but also engaged. Engaged in valuing life the way God does. To defending life, that is all of life, because that truly reflects the image of God in which we were created. Would you pray with me? God, I recognize you as the source of life. You are creator God. You are the author of life, which means you have the authority over life. It is you who values life. God, you have taught us what that looks like by your example. From the moment you created Adam and Eve and breathed life into them, God, you've always valued their life, even when they turned against you and rebelled. You provided them life, especially eternal life, by recognizing the choices that all of us make that break your heart. You don't want to be the end of our story. And so you provided the life of your son, Jesus, of which you valued, your only beloved son. You allowed him to be sacrificed on the cross so that we would be forgiven of the many choices that we make so that we could be forgiven, made whole, cleansed, purified and given eternal life, not because of anything that we have done, but because what you have done on our behalf. God, if that doesn't show how much you value life, I really don't know what is. And so God, I pray that we would respond in faith and trust and submission to your word and what it teaches. That we would value life the way you do from the very moment until the very end. And God, that we'd not be silent, We not be passive, but also not be ignorant. God, we also would not be uh, prejudiced in any way, God. That we would value all of life. Every person we lock eyes with, God, we would see their image, your image in them. And we choose to love them the way that you did, the way Jesus taught us as we follow his example. And God, I pray that in doing so, People would be drawn to you. 
They would know your love and your forgiveness and your grace. I pray that through the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.